Okay, so I have uh, two lectures planned for this evening. I'm going to have to watch the clock here. Um, the first one is, is entitled, What is Sustainability? So what are we going to talk about here? Um, generally speaking, I'll have an agenda, right? This is the way that I learned to make presentations, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell it to them, and then go back and review what you told them. So, um, so we're going to talk about some definitions of the word sustainability. We're going to look at uh, nature as a model of sustainability, right? So one of the things we'll learn in this semester is that we have to figure out ways to reduce the resource impacts of the built environment. So in many cases, nature can be a model for some of the solutions we might be looking for. We'll take a, a look through uh, kind of past and present. Um, what, did, uh, what did the state of Illinois look like 10,000 years ago? What does it look like today? What does that mean for um, the impacts we've had on the environment? We'll talk about sustainable architecture, some definitions of that. What does it mean? And then I'll try to wrap it up by giving you some sense of why I believe this material is important to you. I'm going to have these little uh, uh, interspersed throughout some of my lectures. I'll have uh, I'll have some of these slides with that little bad boy down in the corner, right? That's the that's that little bugger that we're all trying to get rid of, right? The COVID virus. So clearly COVID, COVID has already impacted how we teach. How am I teaching, right? I'm now presenting this material in a virtual classroom. Right? Last year I would have been face to face. However, what's still largely unknown is what impact it will be on what we teach, right? What will the what will our, our industry, what will our business look like a year or two years from now? How will it change because of COVID, right? I don't know. I mean, I have some sense, I have some ideas, but we will have to be finding, th finding these things out. We'll, we'll find them out together. Okay, um, in the marketplace, you hear lots of people using terms such as natural and green and energy efficient and sustainable or sustainability, but what do all those terms mean, right? It's easy to throw those things around. It's a lot more difficult to actually walk the talk. So what does the word sustainable mean? Sustain means to continue or maintain something for a long period of time, right? If you're if you're a pianist, a piano player, right? You'd have a sustained pedal on your piano, and you hit that pedal if you want that note to ring out for a long time. Uh, again, in our business, we're looking for ways to be able to continue doing something for a long time, to have healthy buildings and reduced resource use and allow us to live the life that we've been living for, for many, many more generations to come. So sustainable means the ability to endure, to continue, uh, something that's able to be maintained or kept going, right? We've, the, the world that we live in is, in terms of buildings and transportation and cars and a lot of the things we do, is still a fairly recent invention, right? And certainly in the last, hundred years or even the last 50 years, a lot of this stuff has come about. So the question is, can we keep on doing this for another 50 or 100 or many more years beyond that? That's part of what we'll be exploring here. Um, a, a common definition of sustainability comes from the United Nations. Uh, the Brundtland Report done in the late, 80, late 80s says that Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So what does that mean? It means that, you know, us Americans, it means that we can have 
televisions and cars and iPads and all the things that we have in our modern life. But we have to think about all the folks that are going to be on Earth will be citizens of our country and citizens of the world in the future, right? Are we using up all the resources with our cars and TV sets and and 5,000 square foot houses that make it so folks in the future won't be able to have those same things, right? That's really the test of sustainability, right? Can we meet our own needs without diminishing the ability of future generations to meet their needs, right? It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a hard thing, right? It's not quite the way that we as Americans think, right? We think about what's in it for me, what do I have now, uh, right? Thinking about uh, generations in the future is a little hard for us. So how do we know, how do we measure this? How do we know if our, if the things we do, if our businesses, if our buildings are sustainable, right? Where are the couple, uh, as we, as we move through the semester, we'll find a couple different systems to measure sustainability, right? One way that folks have used to measure sustainability is what's called the triple bottom line, right? You're, you're probably familiar with the, bottom line in a business context, right? In a business context, the bottom line is how much profit, how much money did, did a company, did a firm make in a given year or a given period of time. But to be sustainable, we want to add some additional dimensions to that, right? We see, we see under the three Ps, people, planet, and profits, we see the, the typical monetary bottom line is profits. But we also have to consider the needs of the environment, of the planet, and of the people, right? And if, and if we take the same uh, triple bottom line in, in terms of ease, we have, again, the bottom line that we're most familiar with in terms of economic. We have the planet, we have the environment, and we have equity, right? Equity is, is a way of saying, well, the root of equity is equal, is, is fairness, right? Making sure that resources are shared equally, right? That we don't, we as Americans don't use everything up, but there's nothing left for people in Africa or Southeast Asia, right? That's equity. So it's really at the intersection of those three things, people, planet, and profit, that we get something that is sustainable, right? We can, we can perhaps find it's easy to find a solution that that drives a lot of profit, but may do so at at the at the expense of the planet or of equity, right? So um, we really sustainability is really about finding solutions that exist at that intersection, right? Intersection between the three P's or the three E's. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch gears here, and we're going to watch a little YouTube video and uh, let me do that quickly here. And I uh, better go back and rewind it here. So what is sustainability? You've probably heard the term sustainability in some context or another. Maybe you've used some product or service that was labeled as sustainable. Or maybe you're aware of some campus or civic organization that focuses on sustainability. You may recognize that sustainability has to do with preserving or maintaining resources. We often associate sustainability with things like recycling, using renewable energy sources like solar and wind power, and preserving natural spaces like rainforests and coral reefs. However, unless you have an inherent interest in sustainability, you probably haven't thought much about what the term actually means. This video provides a basic definition of sustainability. Simply put, sustainability is the capacity to endure or continue. If a product or activity is sustainable, 
It can be reused, recycled, or repeated in some way because it has not exhausted all the resources or energy required to create it. We lost volume, Dan. With preserving resources and energy over the long term, rather than exhausting them quickly to meet short-term needs or goals. The term sustainability first appeared in forestry studies in Germany in the 1800s, when forest overseers began to manage timber harvesting for continued use as a resource. In 1804, German forestry researcher Jörg Hartig described sustainability as utilizing forests to the greatest possible extent, but still in a way that future generations will have as much benefit as the living generation. So while our current definitions are quite different and much expanded from Hartig's, Sustainability still accounts for the need to preserve natural spaces, to use resources wisely, and to maintain them in an equitable manner for all human beings, both now and in the future. Sustainability seeks new ways of addressing the relationship between societal growth and environmental degradation, which would allow human societies and economies to grow without destroying or overexploiting the environment or the ecosystems in which those societies exist. The most widely quoted definition of sustainability defines sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As a quick example of sustainability, think about aluminum soda cans. In the past, Many soda cans were used and thrown away without a lot of thought. The practice of throwing them away was unsustainable since ready sources of aluminum are limited and landfills and trash dumps were filling quickly with wasted cans. Consequently, governments and private corporations began to recycle aluminum soda cans. And today, more than 100,000 soda cans are recycled each minute in the United States. A billion dollar recycling industry has emerged, creating jobs and profits for the workers and businesses employed in that enterprise, while at the same time using limited resources more thoughtfully and reducing the impact on the environment. The process has become cyclical rather than linear, resulting in the continued use of materials. But sustainability is about more than just the economic benefits of recycling materials and resources. While the economic factors are important, sustainability also accounts for the social and environmental consequences of human activity. This concept is referred to as the three pillars of sustainability, which asserts that true sustainability depends upon three interlocking factors, environmental preservation, social equity, and economic viability. First, sustainable human activities must protect the Earth's environment. Second, people in communities must be treated fairly and equally, particularly in regard to eradicating global poverty and the environmental exploitation of poor countries and communities. And third, sustainability must be economically feasible. Human development depends upon the long-term production, use, and management of resources as part of a global economy. Only when all three of these pillars are incorporated can an activity or enterprise be described as sustainable. Some describe this three-part model as planet, people, and profit. Our current definitions of sustainability, particularly in the United States, are deeply influenced by our historical and cultural relationship with nature. Many American thinkers, writers, and philosophers have focused on the value of natural spaces, and those ideas contributed to the environmentalist movement that emerged in the second half of the 20th century. Grassroots environmental organizations like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club advocate for the protection and restoration of nature, 
and they lobby for changes in public policy and individual behavior to preserve the natural world. Seen in this way, environmentalism and sustainability have a lot in common. In fact, some people think that our current conversations about sustainability are the next development or evolution of environmentalism. However, earlier environmental debates often pitted the environment against the economy, nature versus jobs. And this dichotomy created a rift between those supporting one side of the debate against the other. Many of the current discussions involving sustainability hope to bridge that gap by looking for possibilities that balance a full range of perspectives and interests. Sustainability encourages and provides incentives for change rather than mandating change. And the three pillars of sustainability emphasize this incorporation. Essentially though, sustainability looks for coordinated innovation to create a future that merges environmental, economic, and social interests rather than setting them in opposition. So in some ways, sustainability is the most important conversation taking place in our society today. The earth is our home, and it provides all the things we need for our survival and nourishment. However, that home has limited resources, and our collective future will depend upon the successful management and use of those resources. We're living in a critical time where global supply of natural resources and ecosystem services is declining dramatically while demand for those resources is escalating. From pollution to resource depletion to loss of biodiversity to climate change, a growing human footprint is evident. This is not sustainable. We need to act differently if the world and its human and non-human inhabitants are to thrive in the future. Sustainability is about how we can preserve the earth and ensure the continued survival and nourishment of future generations. You and everyone you know will be affected in some way by the choices our society makes in the future regarding the earth and its resources. In fact, your very life may well depend upon those choices. Okay, did the, uh, when I muted myself, did I kill the sound of the video? If I did, my apologies. Not for Just the whole video. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let me get back to our presentation here. Um, you see the, the links on the screen there. Again, I will also post a Word document that has a live link, so if you want to click on it and watch it again. Um, it's, it's easy for me because I've watched some of these things many times. So um, for some of you, I think it bears going back and, and looking at them again. But he, he used a couple terms there that that uh, I highlighted on our slide. One, one would be linear versus cyclic, and I'll have a, a graphic uh, in, in a future presentation kind of looking at two different systems. But linear is, is really the way that we typically use resources now, right? We dig stuff out of the ground, we turn it into a product, into a good or service, we use that product, and then we throw it away, right? That's a linear system. Uh, we'll see in a minute that nature doesn't work in a linear fashion. Nature works in a cyclic fashion. You know, resources are are, are reused and, and repurposed, just like the, the aluminum cans that the gentleman talked about. Um, the other term that he used and he didn't really define is ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is are all the things that nature does for us that we don't necessarily think about we, we somehow take for granted right we have 
Um, if you're like me, if you have a garden, and if you have a garden, you have bees and pollinators that make your tomatoes grow, right? That's an ecosystem service. You don't think about it, but if some of those pollinators went away, your tomatoes wouldn't flower or wouldn't fruit, right? Fresh air is an ecosystem service. Um, so things that nature does for us human beings that we don't necessarily think about and we often take for granted. Uh, I'm going to, this next one here is um, probably not as good, so I'm going to skip over it here, but he really talks about the four root causes of unsustainability, right? In, his, in this uh, person's definition, right, the things that we do as human beings that are unsustainable is that we take large amounts of stuff from the Earth's crust, right? We, we dig up oil and fossil fuels and we burn them, right? Um, things that we make as human beings accumulate in the biosphere, right, as waste products. And we get in the way of, of nature running its own cycles. So those are kind of the summarization of that. I'm, I'm watching the clock here already because I, I have a, a shorter class now that I have had in past years. So, but if you're interested in learning more, I'll, I'll leave it to you to go back and watch that one. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about human beings. Let's go back and see how nature functions, right? I, I mentioned that nature is a, can be seen as a model of sustainability. So if we as human beings don't intervene, if we don't disturb, natural systems have the capability of operating in cycles and to remain in balance for a long period of time. That doesn't mean that these systems, natural systems are static. You know, they respond to changes. They respond to changes in rainfall and uh, all sorts of other natural factors, but they tend to remain in balance. So in nature, we have Kind of units called ecosystem. The ecosystem is a community of living organisms and all the non-living things that support them, interacting as a system. So in an ecosystem, all the animals and the plants and the bacteria and the fungi, uh, they all work together in a system. And all those things in nature all go in cycles. So again, in nature, nature is not a once through, nature is not a linear system like we as human beings have created. Nature works in cycles. So again, you'll see this slide as a reminder, probably on, in a couple different uh, presentations that we'll make throughout the semester, right? In a natural system, the only energy input is from the sun, right? Nature doesn't dig up fossil fuels, doesn't dig up oil and natural gas like we as human beings do. The sun provides all the energy in nature. All other resources are reused in cycles. And in a natural system, there is no waste. So think about those three attributes of a natural system in comparison to how most of us lived our lives, right? How most of our buildings function, right? We have a long way to go, but we're making progress. Okay, this one we are gonna watch because it's, it's really interesting uh, and thought provoking. So uh, we'll watch this one here. So give me a second to switch gears again.
Okay, I messed something up here, so give me a second to get out of it. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves killed various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And Beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed in it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less, there was less erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places, and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. That one's pretty cool, I think. Let me uh, 
swap back again. Again, that's something that um, I'll leave you the links. It bears it bears watching again if I can figure out how to. Sorry about that. My screen here is doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Okay, uh, give me a second here. I made a mistake to fix it. Hold on. So you're double tapping on the left side and you're making it bigger. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so again, my points from this short video in nature, everything is interconnected. A change in one place, either positive or negative, will have impacts elsewhere, right? A lot of the things that we as human beings, we do something and it has negative impacts elsewhere in the natural system. In this case, this is an example of something that we as human beings did that had positive impacts, right? We, we reintroduce wolves and lots of other positive things happen. So again, an ecosystem is a complex of living organisms, their physical environment and all their interrelationships in a particular unit of space, right? Yellowstone Park would be an ecosystem. Ecosystem services, as we mentioned, are things that directly or indirectly benefit us as humans, right? Things that we often don't think about, right? Pollination, I mentioned. Uh, flood control is probably another one, right? The, the wetlands, and buffers provide flood control, right? That's an ecosystem service. Things that we as human beings are, are oftentimes destroying. Uh, another term to think about is biodiversity. Again, um, I'm providing you some, some context, some background to understand the materials that, that we're gonna be talking about this semester, right? This isn't a biology class or science class. It's a class in architecture, but I'm just trying to give you some understanding of some broader understanding of, of what we're talking about here. So again, biodiversity means a, a richness of species. It means we have a lot of different things going on in one area, right? Natural systems tend to be biodiverse. So let's spend a few minutes talking about past history, right? Um, in our state of Illinois, before Europeans arrived on this continent, right? Much of Illinois was covered by a ecosystem called a prairie, right? Prairies look like this, a lot of unique plants, right? There are some prairies that you can go look at or, or remnants of prairies that you can see, but this is a, a complex ecosystem, right? So what happened when Europeans came here, right? When Europeans came here, um, we discovered that those rich soils that had been laid down by nature over tens of thousands of years are, hey, that's a good place to grow corn, and hey, that's a good place to go soybeans, right? So what did we as, as, as human beings do? Well, we ripped out all those prairie plants and we started growing crops, right? And to the extent that nowadays most of that prairie is gone, 
But as you see, that's caused some problems, right? The prairie provided a number of important ecosystem services, right? We had, we, we were able to control erosion and control runoff, control invasives. We had a system that took carbon out of the air and stored it into the soil below, right? We'll get to that later on in the semester and we talk about ways that we might mitigate climate change, right? So a, a tall grass prairie was a, was a balanced natural ecosystem, right? Part of the reason that prairie plants work so well is they have very deep roots, right? If you're, if you're like me, my, my grass has gotten pretty brown this time of the year, right? Because I don't bother watering my grass, but all my native plants, they look a little tired and wilty, but they're still doing okay. They haven't died, right? Part of the reason is that they have very deep roots that can reach down and get to that water. Right? And one of the ecosystem services that the prairie provided, right, that we as human beings have been, we as Europeans have been um, taking advantage of is that that prairie ecosystem essentially developed topsoil, right? We've been, we as humans, as we see, have been mining that topsoil. So in contrast to a prairie ecosystem, what we do currently in most of Illinois is what's called a monoculture, right? We grow large amounts of genetically similar plants. Right, be it corn or soybeans, right? We do this for our convenience. We do this because we think that it's productive, but it's not sustainable, right? We can't, you know, we've been doing growing crops this way for 30 or 40 years, maybe a little longer, but we can't continue doing this forever. It's not sustainable, right? In a monoculture, the, the, the species are all very similar. There's only a few species. So when conditions change, that monoculture may or may not be able to adapt. One of the ways that natural systems adapt is through diversity, right? Diversity of species. Um, when conditions change, certain species will emerge and be more successful than other species. So what are some of the issues? Uh, and I'll, I'll go through these quickly, right? We, we in our monoculture, we have less diverse ecosystems and we'll be less able to respond to changing conditions, right? What, what kind of changing conditions might there be, right? We're, we're, we're likely to see a future that's warmer and drier than, than the world we live in today, right? We have, we have a loss of topsoil. We have topsoil erosion, all that beautiful soil that was laid down by the prairie ecosystems, we as human beings are using it up. Right? We're, we're losing soil far faster than our natural systems can regenerate it. Right? Again, we can't, we can't continue to do this forever. Again, sustainability is thinking about the long term, right? If we use up all the topsoil in Iowa and Illinois and could no longer grow crops, that's a bad thing, right? All the, all the fertilizers, all the things that we put into our agricultural systems in, in the Mississippi River Basin, right, in, in Illinois and Iowa and the places we go corn, all those fertilizers end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we don't see them, but they cause water pollution problems in the Gulf. You know, we have habitat loss, et cetera, et cetera, right? Lots of, lots of things that, that we as human beings do and human beings do in our current ecosystems that have uh, impacts on the natural world. So um, let's switch gears and talk about sustainable architecture, right? We're, we are in, a, in an architecture class. 
So sustainable architecture refers to the practice of designing buildings which create living environments that work to minimize the human use of resources, right? That's what a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing this semester is about minimizing the use of resources. It's not about necessarily having bad buildings or poor buildings. You know, it's, it's finding ways to have delightful, well-functioning buildings, but do them in a way that minimizes resource use. And resource use, we will broadly construe not only the energy that's used to heat and cool and ventilate the building, but also the materials that are used in the construction and operation of that building, right? We're looking for ways to minimize the human use of resources. Okay, another, uh, another slide with that evil little bugger in the corner, right? Health and safety have always been important considerations in the way we design and build and operate and maintain buildings. Again, when I look around, I think that those things will become more important at least in the near term, perhaps at the expense of energy efficiency, right? In my business, I'm a mechanical engineer. You know, my professional society has developed guidance to use for people that own and operate buildings to tell them how they can operate their buildings to mitigate or to reduce the, the, the risks from COVID, right? One of the things that we're doing now is we are bringing in more outside air and we're increasing the rates of ventilation. Right? Those are things that improve the health and safety of the building, but they increase the energy consumption. So right now we're making a trade-off because we think that health and safety is more important. We'll have to see how that plays out going forward. So what are some of the attributes of sustainable architecture? Sustainable architecture has healthful interior environment. Again, now we're, we're more, excuse me, more concerned about health. In this case, I was thinking about the materials in, used in the building, and now we have to also look at the ventilation rates and make sure that, you know, when someone coughs or sneezes without a mask on, that the ventilation systems get rid of all those viral particles and don't circulate them around for other people to get sick. Right? We want sustainable architecture means we are efficient in the use of resources, again, both energy as well as materials. We're using ecologically benign materials. Benign is a word you may not be familiar with, right? Benign means it's not harmful, right? We don't want toxic, harmful things in our building, right? We want to build and operate and maintain buildings with materials that don't make people sick, right? We want, we want our buildings to be good design. We want them to relate to the site that they're in. Uh, one thing that, you know, Francis and I notice when we drive around the country is that, you know, homes look almost the same. We drove from, from Chicago to Denver and back a couple of weeks ago to visit our grandchildren. And, and we noticed that, you know, townhouses and, and relatively new construction all looks the same all the way from Chicago to Denver, even though we pass through a number of different climates, right? That's not necessarily the way that you should design things. So what are some of the key features of green buildings, right? I'll use the terms green and sustainable somewhat interchangeably here, but um, key features of green buildings is that we want to build near other existing buildings, right? We want to reutilize, reuse existing sites or existing buildings with we can. We don't want to build in a natural area. We want to build near public transportation, right? The reason that we are building near other buildings is that we want to utilize the infrastructure that's already been built, right? Infrastructure means the, the water supply and the sewer systems and the electricity, all the things that that support the building, why we don't want to have to build all that stuff new. We want to utilize infrastructure that's already been built. And obviously we want to locate near public transportation. So if possible, people don't have to drive their cars to get to the buildings that we're designing and building. Right? We want 
green or sustainable buildings to be energy efficient, right? We minimize energy use by integrated design. I'll have a lecture later when we get into the lead stuff about what integrated design means. Integrated means that the all the people on the design team are all working together to produce the best outcome. And ideally, if we make the building envelope as efficient as possible, then we we provide for the possibility of on-site production of the energy that that building needs. Right, we want buildings to be efficient in their use of water. Right, this slide is is uh, in downtown Chicago. This is the roof of City Hall. I don't know whether it still exists this way. Right, but years ago, the now two mayors ago, Mayor Daly, right, he had a he had a green kick and he had a green roof installed on the city half of city and county building downtown. So, but a water efficient building minimizes the use of domestic water supply from offsite. And it also retains the rainwater that falls on the site to minimize that stormwater discharged offsite and minimizes the discharge of wastewater. Right, a green building is wise in the use of its building, right? If, in the use of its materials. If possible, we use recycled or repurposed materials. Uh, we wanna use materials that are renewable, right? Re wood is a renewable material. We'll talk about materials a little bit uh, uh, later on in the semester. Ideally, we wanna find materials that are obtained locally or near the building site, right? So we're not trucking stuff halfway across the country to get to our building site. And we want to have materials that are not toxic in their production or in their use, right? Benign, non-toxic, not harmful. Again, I probably should, should touch this slide up a little bit because I'm talking about healthy indoor environment, right? It probably has to be a healthy and safe indoor environment. The building is well ventilated so the indoor air is fresh. Uh, nowadays the, the building is also well ventilated so uh, the, the air in the mechanical system doesn't spread viral particles from one person to another. Right? We, we ideally want to have a lot of daylight in our building and again non-toxic products both in the in the construction of the building, the finishes, and also the, the materials that we use for, for cleaning and maintenance. Talked about renewable building materials. These are materials that are found in nature and produced in a way that their availability and quality does not diminish over time, right? And that in the first video, we talked about the, the German forester that said that if we manage our forests in a way that they're that they're available forever, right? That's sustainable. So, you know, one of our options in in reducing human use of resources for buildings is to use renewable renewable materials in our construction of the of these uh, of these buildings. One option we also have is is recycling materials, recycling building products, or perhaps recycling other materials and using them as part of our building. I think in the 108 class, I think Francis may end up. I've I've sent to my previous 110 classes to reuse depot and may what I suspect that Francis may do that as part of the 108 portion of this. All right, we want green or sustainable buildings to relate to the site and the climate, right? They don't, we don't want the building to look like it was picked up in one part of the country and dropped someplace else. We want it to make sense based on um, the sun and the wind and, and the natural systems in that site. One other idea, certainly something that we see a lot of in the city of Chicago is adaptive reuse, right? Buildings that can no longer serve their original purpose can be adapted or repurposed to do something else, right? It's a lot more resource efficient, 
for us to repurpose than it is to tear down and build new. So again, attributes of sustainable architecture, health and safety, resource efficiency, non-toxic or benign materials, good design, and relates to the climate and the site. So why am I teaching this class? Why am I, uh, why am I trying to impart this knowledge on you? Why should you be concerned about these things? Well, I think that this is the way that our industry is going. This will be what you will be doing in the future. Um, I believe that knowing these things will help set you apart in the marketplace, right? That's part of the reason that we are having you prepare you and having you sit for the LEED GA exam, the Green Associates exam, right? That's a credential that people will be looking for in the future. And you as citizens of the 21st century, there's lots of things that challenges that we will be facing, right? Obviously COVID is a challenge now, but hopefully COVID won't last forever. Hopefully COVID will go away. But lots of the other challenges we are facing aren't going away, right? Climate change, water scarcity, availability of resources, human migration, right? Those are all things that you'll be dealing with in the 21st century. So you have the opportunity to make a positive contribution in your work, right? In your personal life and also in your professional career. Okay, any questions? Great, why don't we take a, uh, let's take a, a 10 minute break here. So we will get back again at about quarter after the hour and uh, we will continue on to our second lecture topic. So thank you, sit tight and we'll be right back. 